Good morning, church. Uh, It is such great weather out there today. I love this time of year. Usually, I'll love it at least for the next few days, uh, as Tara was saying, but what a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord today. I'm tempted to just let uh, us sit under the lyrics of that song that we just sang. Um, Jesus is holy, and he's he's worthy of our worship and our praise, Uh, and if nothing else today, I hope that is so clear. Uh, Today's text, uh, today's word has much to say to us, uh, more than we have time to cover uh, in this short period, just of the excellencies of Christ and what he's done for us. So I hope that shines through this morning. Um, So I'm happy to be here with you, happy to open the word of God uh, with you, church, here this morning. Um, One of my favorite books, uh, movie series, I think I probably introduce most, 90% of my sermons with uh, this story or some uh, form from it, uh, is uh, Tolkien's classic, The Lord of the Rings. And Gandalf is one of my favorite characters, as he is most people's, I believe. Um, But at the beginning of uh, The Lord of the Rings, early on, uh, Gandalf discovers uh, that Bilbo Baggins has had this ring of power, this ring that is supposed to allow you to subdue all of your enemies uh, in one fell swoop. Uh, and Gandalf sees the danger there because the ring is evil and it wants to entice anybody who holds on to it. And, and Frodo has this ring, Bilbo's nephew has the ring, and he, he hands it to Gandalf in the scene. And Gandalf shrinks back in a way and he says, I dare not take this ring. I would desire to use it for good, but it would be wielded through me for great evil. So he resists his temptation to take the ring. And he could, you know, Gandalf knows the the path of destroying the ring and defeating evil is going to be long and arduous. And he could take this ring and and have a shortcut to that. Instead of travailing to Mount Doom and all the treacherous paths there are, he could take the ring and use it to defeat his enemy. He could defeat evil with evil. But he chooses not to. He steps back and instead he begins This journey with the hobbits, that's going to last a long, long, arduous time. Now, there's one scene, maybe my favorite scene in the whole series, kind of in the thick, in the midst of this journey, where Gandalf comes face to face with this demonic enemy called a Balrog, right? He's on the the bridge of Khazad Doom, and they're battling, and they're warring. This enemy looks so much greater, like he's going to defeat him. Uh, I've got an awesome picture up there uh, to, to illustrate Uh, But he ends up battling this demon and gets dragged down with him into the underworld. All his friends watch him fall. It looks as though he's passed from life to death as he uh, falls into the depths. Uh, And then we see later, spoiler alert, it's an old book, so hopefully uh, I'm not spoiling it for you. We see later that he actually lands in the depths on a high mountain and battles this Balrog and defeats him. And then he comes back. He emerges, not as Gandalf the Grey, but as Gandalf the White. And as this new sort of being, because of what he accomplished, because he defeated the enemy, he's able to be the hero that the people need, that the hobbits need, and really that all of Middle Earth needs to continue this journey and to finally throw the ring into the depths and fires of Mordor and everything is good. Okay, but he had to, he had to go through the pit He couldn't take the shortcut, but he had to descend even into the depths uh, in order to emerge as this hero. And and I hope that is going to illustrate for us what Christ did, what he accomplished. I mean, if you remember early on in his ministry, like he's offered the solution on the mountain by Satan. Worship me and you can have the kingdoms. You can have all the kingdoms of the world. They're yours. You don't need to suffer. You don't need to die. You don't need to go to the cross. Just worship me. Defeat evil with evil. Right? You don't need to go by the way of suffering. But of course, we know the story. Jesus does descend into the very death itself, and he emerges as the, as the high priest that we need. Uh, the main point here is Jesus Christ is the high priest. He became the high priest that we all need. And we've heard a lot about high priesthood already. Right? Last week sort of introduced this. This week is going to introduce what follows, all the way through chapter 10. In fact, in chapter 8... The author of Hebrews says, the main point of what I'm writing is this, 
We have such a high priest. This is the point of the book of Hebrews. Uh, William Bridge says, Christ's office as high priest, or sorry, Christ's office as priest is the great storehouse and supply of all the grace and comfort that we have this side of heaven. Through Christ's priesthood, we are reconciled to God the Father and are relieved against all temptations. This is the great truth held forth in these words. That's why the apostle, finding the Hebrews laboring under great temptations, doubts, fears, and unbelief, expounds the priestly office of Christ throughout this letter. This is what a suffering congregation tempted to fall away. This is the message that they needed, the high priesthood of Christ. And that's the message that we as a church need today. So we're going to delve in here. Uh, I want to start, though, uh, by laying some groundwork that I think can be helpful as we look at Christ's high priesthood um, throughout the next several weeks uh, on and through chapter 10. So, so I want us to look at sort of what the, what the Old Testament and the Bible as a whole says about priesthood. Like, what's the big deal? Uh, when we think about priesthood, we typically think about the, the Levitic priest, Levitical priesthood uh, with the tabernacle, right? And you think about the structure of the tabernacle, uh, you sort of have the outer land of Israel, and then you have the outer court where the kind of squares off the, the tabernacle, and then even closer to the center, you have the holy place where you sort of enter by, by, a, by a tent, and then even farther into the center, you have the holy of holies, separated, uh, separated by this veil, uh, and that is where the high priest would enter once a year uh, to offer sins for the people. And that is where God dwelt with his people in the Holy of Holies. The Ark and the Covenant was there. There were uh, two cherubim uh, made on top of this Ark that represented them guarding it. Um, so you had the tabernacle. You had that structure. And then you had the priests. The priests were the ones that were tasks with, tasked with uh, sort of uh, looking after the order of the tabernacle, they were tasked with uh, protecting it from outside uh, d- danger and enemies. Uh, and then they, they offered gifts. They offered sacrifices we're going to see here in a moment. So you had the tabernacle. You had the priests. And, and this is how God's presence was mediated to the people uh, under the law in the Old Testament. Uh, but, but what I want us to see today is that it actually goes farther back than that. So if you look at the Garden of Eden... And this has been uh, sort of studied and looked at, and and people have noticed the connections between the Garden of Eden and the tabernacle for a very long time. But the the geography of Eden is supposed to point us to the tabernacle. So you have sort of the the dry land, the area that was created, but then within that, you have the Garden of, or you have, sorry, you have Eden, the land of Eden. And most people think Eden equals the Garden. But it's actually separate. You have Eden, and then within Eden, even farther to the center, you have this garden. And then in the middle of the garden, you have this tree of life, right? And the closer you get into the center, just as with the tabernacle, the closer you get to the dwelling and presence of God. And then you have Adam and Eve placed into the garden, into Eden, and there we're, we're told that they serve as sort of God's royal ambassadors, right? They're told to have dominion over the earth, uh, to subdue it, to multiply, to fill the earth with the glory of God. So they're sort of God's kingly representatives. But they're also depicted as God's priests in the garden. So, so the command that Adam and Eve are given uh, to, to work the garden and to keep it is the exact same language that priests are given to care for and protect the tabernacle. So Adam and Eve's job within the garden is not only to rule on behalf of God and to have dominion over creation, but to serve as priests, to serve as mediators between God and the creation, uh, to protect the garden from disorder and from from outside danger. How'd they they do with that? Right? An outside influence comes in. Adam and Eve don't do the job of protecting it from danger. And of course... Everything turns to, um, to trouble and to uh, away from God's original intent. They failed in their priestly task, and so they failed in their kingly role. But that was the intention. 
That was the original intention. God placed Adam and, Eve in, Adam and Eve in his image in the garden to serve as rulers and to serve as priests and to serve as mediators between God and creation as he dwelled with his people. So we need to keep that in mind, this kingly, priestly function of the original intent of humanity, the fact that they failed in that. And if you look at the Levitical priesthood, very quickly after Aaron is installed, what does he do? You have this golden calf, this image, which is commanded not to do so. There's a, there's a massive failure there as well. And so the whole Old Testament is God righting the wrongs of what went wrong in the garden. And then continually we see the rebellion of the people turning away from their God-given task and seeking after false gods and false idols. Uh, and they're waiting we see in Genesis 3.15, there's a waiting for someone who will come and serve as that priest and as that king perfectly, where humanity over and over again is going to fail. So that brings us to our text today. Uh, we talked last week about Jesus' high priesthood, how he is able to, to sympathize with humanity because he entered into their suffering. He entered into their temptations, and he was, uh, he was victorious in those temptations. He was without sin, though he was able to sympathize with our weakness. The, the author here is going to expound more on that idea and add some more flavor and color to it as we continue to move forward. So the structure of our text is pretty straightforward. It starts off with the work of the Old Testament high priest. It talks about the work. It talks about how they have solidarity with the people, uh, it talks about how they're appointed by God. And then in reverse order, it compares Christ's priesthood to the Old Testament priesthood, beginning with his appointment by God, the solidarity of Jesus, our great high priest, and the perfect work of Jesus, our great high priest. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through the text in that order, and we're going to see what this text has to say about Jesus and the perfection of his priesthood. Okay, so first we see in verse in 5.1, the work of the high priest. We see that every priest, every high priest is appointed, taken from among men, is appointed by God to act on behalf of men in matters pertaining to God. So they serve as mediators, right? They're mediators between the people and God. Uh, part of their work is they offer gifts and they offer sacrifices uh, for the sins of the people. And we saw this when we went through Leviticus, but the, the whole Levitical sacrificial system highlights the sin of the people. The fact that we, on our own, because of sin, because of what has gone wrong in the world, because of our own rebellion against God, we need a mediator between us and God because he is holy and he is just. And so the sacrificial system highlights the reality that we cannot save ourselves, and it points us to our need for someone greater than even the human high priest that can undo the wrong that was done in Adam and Eve's and our own rebellion against a holy God. The, the call of the gospel, and, and we hear this so often, is not, is there something wrong in your life? Maybe you're lonely. You know, give Jesus a try and, and you won't be anymore. Or, or, you know, maybe you're just, you're struggling with unhappiness you know, if you try Jesus, maybe you'll, you'll find that he'll, you know, make you happy and, and, and so there, you can have happiness again. Or whatever it is, we kind of plug those things in and say, give Jesus a try and, you know, he'll make it better. And there are great blessings that come along with knowing Christ, but the, the gospel is how do we, sinners who are, who are beset with sin, who are clothed with sin, sin surrounds us like a garment. How do we approach a holy God? How do we get right with a holy God? And, and until we understand that reality first, we're not going to truly recognize our need for a mediator, our need for someone to bring us back to fellowship with God and that, because that fellowship has been broken. And so we see that in the high priest. He offers gifts. He offers sacrifices. In matters pertaining to God on behalf of the people, because people are sinful and God is holy. And this is going to point us to our need for someone 
who can wrong all that, or has, who can right all that has been made wrong. So we see the work of the high priest. Okay, we see the solidarity of the high priest with the people. Right, it says he is able to deal gently with the ignorant and with the wayward, since he himself is beset with sin. And because of this, he is obligated to offer sins on his own behalf as well as, or offer sacrifices on his own behalf as well as on behalf of the people. Not only are the people clothed or beset with sin, but the high priest is as well. So he, he shouldn't be harsh with the people, right? Because he himself needs to have offer, he has to offer sacrifices for his own self. But so there's a solidarity there between the high peace, priest and the people. Like he can relate to them. Because he's a human, he is able to go to God on their behalf, offer sacrifices for himself and for the people. The priest should not act indifferently towards sin, but neither should he be harsh with repentant sinners because he knows from personal experience how prone that we are to sin. Okay, and then finally we see the appointment of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant high priest. Uh, We see that he is appointed by God. It says, and he doesn't take this honor upon himself, uh, but he is called by God, just as also Aaron was. So if you remember, after Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt, uh, Aaron is appointed as high priest. Okay, he's called by God. And then from there, successors of Aaron become the high priests, and that's all according to God's purposes. It's God who proclaims the high priest. People don't appoint a priest, and the peoples don't appoint themselves. They had to actually prove through genealogy, and that'll be important in a, in a couple of chapters. They had to prove through genealogy that they were of the Levitical line in order for them to be a legitimate high priest. But that all started with the appointment by God. Through God's ordained mediator, uh, these priests themselves, even though they're sinners themselves, uh, they're inadequate, uh, they're appointed by God to act on behalf of the people, and that just it demonstrates the, the ultimately the inadequacy of that priesthood. The, it, it, the fact that the priests in and of themselves need to sacrifice for themselves uh, shows that even though this was God's appointed way for mediation between God and the people, it pointed to something else. Like that can't be the end of it. Uh, and that's where verses 6 through 10 come in. Because now the author is going to compare Jesus' high priesthood to that of the Old Testament high priest. And he's going to do that in reverse order. So we see first the appointment of Jesus, the great high priest. So just as Aaron didn't appoint himself, Christ didn't appoint himself. He didn't seek his own glory. It says he didn't exalt himself to become high priest, but rather the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's from Psalm 2, 7. It's interesting that in talking about the high priesthood of Christ, the author here goes to Psalm 2, 7, which is a kingly psalm. It's, it's, a, it's a, a prophecy of the, of the messianic king who would come from the line of David. You are my son, today I have begotten you. So when talking about a priesthood, he quotes a psalm that predicts a king who will come. And so you see this this link between the kingship and the priesthood already. And we saw that as part of God's original attention in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were meant to be ruler priests, royal priests. And then the author continues to go on, and he quotes another psalm, Psalm 110, 1. And he prophesies uh, that someone will come. uh, In verse 4, "You you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. So you got two prophecies uh, regarding the coming Messiah. A kingly one, and then one that talks about him being a priest. But it's a, it's a different kind of priest. And here we're introduced to an interesting kind of enigmatic figure who's mysterious that we haven't heard about before, at least in the New Testament. And Christ's priesthood is after the order of this man named Melchizedek. The author is going to expound a lot more on Melchizedek in chapter 7, so I'm just going to say a few things here. Okay, so in Genesis 
chapter 14, uh, the story about Melchizedek. It's the first time he appears in the Bible. Uh, Abraham has just rescued Lot uh, from these five armies and five kings that kidnapped Lot away from the land of Sodom. And Abraham is on his way back, having rescued Lot. And this guy just shows up, a guy by the name of Melchizedek. Uh, literally, the name means my king is righteous, uh, or the name righteous, it's Sedek, my king is Sedek. And Sedek was an Old Testament, or sorry, not an Old Testament, but an ancient Canaanite deity. All right? And at this time, uh, the land of Canaan uh, was under the, the, it wasn't, David hadn't taken over Jerusalem. So Melchizedek comes along, he would have been associated with the deities of Canaan at the time. So his name likely is a, is a reference to the deity that uh, ruled his land, right? He's the king of Salem. We'll talk about that in a moment. So his name uh, gives homage to this, this deity, but we see that he doesn't worship this deity, but that he's a priest of El Elyon, of God Most High. And so this, this, this priest, this king uh, with a name that pays homage to a uh, false god comes to Abraham, and we find out that he actually worships the one true God. And so they have this interaction. Uh, Melchizedek blesses Abraham, and Abraham pays a tithe to Melchizedek, and then Melchizedek sort of leaves. And that's it. That's all we have. And then he's quoted here in Psalm 110, and then he's quoted in the New Testament in Hebrews. And that's really the, the majority of what we have regarding Melchizedek. So, so why is he quoted here and what's his significance? We, we could talk a lot about Melchizedek, but I think the main point here is that we have this priest, as the author of Hebrews is looking back in the Old Testament, you have this priest before the priesthood of Aaron whose name has to do with righteousness, right? Later on uh, the, in Hebrews, he's going to say that the translation of Melchizedek is king of righteousness, which is a, a proper translation of that name, king of righteousness. We also see that he's the king of Salem, which before David conquered Jerusalem, Salem would have been Jerusalem, what would become the capital of Israel. So you have this king who's also a priest. His name is king of righteousness. Uh, he's king of Jerusalem before it really became Jerusalem, right before David made it Jerusalem. Uh, and his name also means king of peace. So you have this profile of this figure who's pretty mysterious, and not, not a lot is said about him, but... In his profile, he's, we got kingship. We got Jerusalem from where the Messiah is going to come. He's king of righteousness. His name uh, means king of righteousness. Uh, king of Jerusalem, Salem means peace. So he's associated with peace. So kingship, righteousness, peace, priesthood. He's loyal to the one true God, even though he's surrounded by the false gods of the day. So this Melchizedek is a priest like Adam. He's a royal priest whose name and titles indicate God's original intention for humanity. Remember, Adam and Eve were called to be priests and rulers in God's garden. And so Jesus' priesthood goes back before the Levitical priesthood under the Old Covenant law all the way to God's original intention for humanity, to be king, to be priest, to rule on God's behalf in the world. So we see in this reference to Melchizedek, sort of the author of Hebrews saying, look, Jesus doesn't need to be after the order of Aaron because he's not. He descends from the tribe of Judah, the messianic king from David. And why does he not need to be a priest after the order of Aaron? Because the priesthood goes back before that. And indeed, it goes all the way back to Adam. And we even see that in this figure of Melchizedek. We'll say a lot more about Melchizedek in a couple of weeks. But we see here that Jesus is not only our king and not only our high priest, but he is our great high priestly king. And that goes back before Levitical priesthood. So we see that Jesus is the perfect high priest that we need because his priesthood doesn't stem from the imperfection of the priesthood under Aaron, but of the per perfect priesthood that God established in the garden. And we even see glimpses of in a figure like Melchizedek. So that's the, the appointment of Christ as high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and it's true because God declares it to be 
So he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And, and we go on to see Jesus' solidarity with his people. Just as thy priest had solidarity with the people on behalf of whom they offered sacrifices, Jesus has solidarity with his people. We saw last week he, he understands their weakness even though he was without sin. Here, the author of Hebrews looks back at the life of Christ. It says, in the days of his flesh, right, he offered prayers and supplications with, with great cries and, and tears. We, we see the, the emotion of Jesus and the fact that he went through the gauntlet of human suffering. And, and it wasn't as though he just sort of like floated through the realm of the earth and nothing touched him. But he, but he experienced uh, the struggle and the difficulty and the suffering of what it means to be in the flesh. I think that phrase, in the days of his flesh, highlights the weakness of humanity, and, and it, this characterizes his entire ministry. Um, one of my uh, favorite scenes in the Chosen series, I don't know if some of y'all probably watch it, uh, is, a, is a, or not scenes, but episodes. In the episode, you, you, you barely see uh, the figure of Jesus at all in the episode. Instead, he is in the background, and the whole episode is about how people are coming to him, being healed. He's ministering to them. Uh, he's serving them. Um, he's, he's speaking with them and talking with them. He's taking the time out of his day to, to, to minister to the people. And we see summary passages in the New Testament where it talks about, you know, they all came to him and he healed them all, right? And you just kind of gloss over that. But imagine the amount of time and energy and effort that it took for him to to minister to all these crowds that were coming. So in this episode, he's kind of in the background. You rarely see him. And in the forefront are his disciples kind of talking as this is going on. And, and as it goes, they're, they're continuing to kind of talk about how, you know, what they've left to follow Jesus and what they've given up. And, and at the end, you see Peter, like, getting angry at Matthew because Matthew used to be a tax collector. And, and Peter's like, I will never forgive you for what you did. Like, you, you turned your back on the Jewish people and you served the Romans as a tax collector. And you kind of see these conversations. And then Jesus walks up and he says, good night. That's all he says. And he walks to his tent and he like falls over tired. And his, his mother comes and, and ministers to him, washes his feet. And he's like, thank you, mother. What could I do? What would I have done without you? Like, what would I do without you? And you just see like his, his weariness and his tiredness, and it's such a contrast with how, you know, Peter's like, I won't forgive you, Matthew, because of this, and, and these, these men who are, who are weak, and who are always get it wrong, and who are struggling, and then you have Jesus, the Son of God, who has taken on human flesh, and he's ministering to people all day to the point of exhaustion, people whose sin are going to bring him to the cross, and that contrast just, it's, to me, it shows just the, the beauty of the humiliation of Christ and the fact that he really can sympathize with our weakness because he's entered into it. About a year ago, uh, Ashley and I were in the car and we often we listen to the conversations of our kids in the back. Um, one conversation that has always just stuck with me uh, that's so funny is uh, Tabitha said something like, um, Elliot, I can't wait to grow up and get married or something like that. And Elliot was like, yeah, I can't wait to get married too. But then she was like, but then we have to do a lot of hard things. She's like, we have, we have to learn, we got to learn to brush our hair. She's like, we need to learn how to brush our teeth. She said, we got to learn to drive. She's like, we have to learn to put on lotion. I'm like, where'd that come from? <laughs> then she, so, so she lists all these, these things that she thinks is like adulting. Like, it'll be great, but then there's a lot of hard stuff. And those are the hard things, right? She didn't talk about taxes. She didn't talk about caring for little kids. Uh, all the things that uh, are, come along with aspects of adulting. But she was, she was sympathizing, kind of, right? But, but not really. Because all those things aren't really the adulting things, right? Those aren't the hard things. But, but Jesus, he actually sympathizes. He actually knows. He actually enters into our weakness, in the days of his flesh, he offered prayers and supplications for himself and for his people with great cries and tears. We also have this interesting phrase here that he learned obedience through suffering, right? And, and Tyler talked about this quite a bit last week, I believe. We don't have to go into it 
uh, too much, but I think it's important to recognize that Jesus, when he was in heaven, you know, before time began, he didn't know what it was like to obey, right? There, there's no obedience between the persons of the Trinity. They are all one. So when he enters into this human experience, he becomes completely and fully dependent on the Father and the will of the Father. He does only the will of the one who sent him. So he learns obedience. And we know that sometimes it's the most hard to obey when we're suffering, right? I've, I've experienced this in my own life where I'm tempted toward apathy and I'm just like, why are you allowing these things to happen? Why am I in the hospital again? Why has this loved one passed away again? Like, why is this happening over and over again? And we're tempted to grumble and we're tempted to complain. And, and maybe you're in the thick of that right now where things are happening in your life uh, and you don't know why. And it doesn't seem to get better. Or if it does, maybe there's a small reprieve and then it's back again. And and we can look at what Jesus endured and what he suffered, even to the point of death on the cross and taking on himself the sin of humanity, right? And he obeyed perfectly. He obeyed perfectly. So he can become what we need as a great high priest. We can come to him in our struggles, in our complaints, in our trials, and know that he is there pleading for us on behalf, on behalf of us to the Father uh, before his throne above. That's why, as we talked about last week, we can draw near to the throne with boldness. So he, he prayed to the one who was able to deliver him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Some might say, well, he wasn't really heard because he died, right? And we think about the time in Gethsemane where Jesus was laid bare before the Father to the point where he sweat great drops of blood. And his final prayer was not my will, but your will be done. And indeed, Jesus was delivered from death, right? He took on the full force of death and the wrath of God against sin, but then he was delivered up. Just as Gandalf was raised up from the pit, having defeated the enemy and became the hero that they needed, Jesus went and preached captives to those in the grave, to those in the realm of the dead, and he was raised up and became the high priest that we all need. And then we see his work. Through his sufferings, through his obedience, he was perfected. I think that means that he became the high priest that we need. His mission was complete. We talked about this a few weeks ago. The idea of perfection there doesn't mean imperfection or sin, to not sin, but of a completion of his mission. And so he is now exalted to the right hand of the Father and has become the high priest that we all need. When suffering strikes us, our inclination is to do whatever it takes to avoid it. Like, I don't want to be uncomfortable. If, if there's a way I can get out of it, I will. But Jesus learned to trust God in the midst of his suffering. And because of that, he became the great high priest that we all need as he was delivered up from death and completed his mission victoriously and is now seated at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. And we see in many great hymns that when the Savior intercedes on our behalf, his prayers are always heard. So we can approach the throne boldly. So we have the work of Jesus our great high priest. So we get sort of back to the question we asked uh, earlier, right? How do humans beset with sin, clothed with sin, like we wear sin as a garment, like how do we approach a holy God? And the New Testament authors tell us to put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 through 27, Paul writes that in Christ Jesus we are all sons and daughters of God through faith. For as many of you who are baptized into Christ have, have clothed yourselves with Christ, who have put on Christ. That garment of sin that surrounded us is cast aside and Christ becomes our identity. Paul instructs believers in Romans to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and so make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Um. 
as the band comes up, I just want to ask a few questions um, and, and encourage us as children of God who believe in this Jesus as the great high priest. Are we leaning in and drawing comfort from the high priestly work of Christ in every area of our lives, in our guilt? You know, we're going to come uh, this morning, we're going to ask questions of ourselves. Like, have we sinned against the Lord? Uh, have we treasured other things? The answer is always yes. Do we dwell on that, or do we see that because of what Christ has accomplished, we can boldly proclaim the rest of that confession? That, that the Father is there, ready and willing, and has forgiven us. That Jesus has paid this penalty for our sin in full, and so he is the high priest that we all need. In our guilt, in our temptation, in our sorrows when we're suffering, are we learning to draw grace and comfort from the high priesthood of Christ? We all experience suffering and sorrow and guilt, temptation, joy, all the emotions of life. So in all of those things, let us look to Christ and what he has accomplished. One of the, the best hymns that I've read and sang by Charles Wesley puts it this way. Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice on my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands because my name is written on his hands. Five bleeding wounds he bears received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. Forgive him, oh forgive him. They cry, don't let that ransom sinner die. As Christ is pleading on our behalf because of his finished work, he is now our great kingly high priest. Let us look to him and draw grace and help in time of need. Pray with me, church. Father, we thank you so much just for the truth of that gospel. We thank you that, that Christ has humiliated himself and entered into our humanity. From the throne of heaven to the, to the dirt and to the grave, Father, he has entered into where we are. He knows what it's like to be weak. He knows what it's like to face temptation and trials and suffering. Yet he was without sin. He did what we could not. So, Father, he is now able to be the perfect high priest that we all need so that we can approach your throne of grace boldly in our sufferings, in our trials, in our sin and temptation. So I pray that we would do that today. As we sing, as we take communion, as we think about this work of Christ, may we approach you boldly because of what he has done, because we have this great high priest. Father, we praise you and we thank you for the work of Christ. And it's his name that we pray, amen.